afternoon and welcome to the City Club of Portland's Friday Forum, Oregon's premier public affairs forum. I'm Jim Zarin, president of the City Club, and I welcome you all, those of you here at the Governor Hotel, and those of you listening on OPB or KBPS radio or watching on cable television. Thank you for joining us for this week's Friday Forum on this, the 15th of May, 2009. Today we welcome the Governor of Oregon, who will address the status and outlook for our state's economy and our state government's budget, given the most recent economic projections and as the Oregon uh, Legislative Assembly heads into the key budget writing phase of the 2009 legislative session. But first, some announcements. In consideration of those sitting close to you and those in our radio and TV audiences, I ask everyone in the room if you haven't already done so, to please turn off your cell phones and other devices that might make noise. As always, we offer our appreciation to our Friday Forum corporate sponsors for this quarter, without whose generous financial support these time-honored City Club Friday Forum luncheons would not be possible. Our corporate sponsors for this quarter are the law firm of Schwabe, Williamson & Wyatt, Portland General Electric, and Northwest Natural. And today I am particularly pleased to have with us representatives from each of these three corporate sponsors who I would like to recognize. So as I introduce our special guests, I would like them to stand and remain standing and then we can thank them uh, all together. First, Mark Long, Managing Shareholder, uh, and Don Williams, Chief Operating Officer of the Schwabe, Williamson & Wyatt Law Firm. Next, Carol Dillon, Vice President of Public Policy for Portland General Electric. And third, Greg Cantor, President and Chief Executive Officer of Northwest Natural. Please join me in thanking them for their support. You know, especially during these difficult economic times, financial support from great Oregon businesses like these are critical to sustaining City Club, uh, the 93-year-old iconic uh, part of the Portland infrastructure that it is. So if your company or firm would like to help, by becoming a corporate sponsor of these Friday forums or by sponsoring our citizen-driven, nationally acclaimed research program, please contact City Club staff at the back of the room or contact the club office. And if you don't contact us, please know that we may be contacting you. Now in the same vein, if you don't already know, please know that City Club is in the uh, middle of its uh, uh, spring membership drive. This is a very important effort every year and it's particularly important this year as the club is working hard at filling an operating deficit that we're facing due to the economy that we all know about. Now we have a large crowd he here today and I'm interested if everybody that's a current City Club member could just raise your hands. Fabulous. Now for those of you who raised your hands, please take it upon yourself to scout out those who did not. <laughs> uh, and, and uh, think about uh, asking one of them to become a member of City Club today. And for those of you who are not members of City Club, please do consider joining. Uh, there are some membership brochures on the table. There are others at the membership table in the back of the room on your way out. Or you can call the club office or join online. Uh, and when you join during this membership drive, the club is waiving its $25 one-time membership fee and both the recruiter and those recruited will receive a free brochure, it's not brochure, voucher. <laughs> You'll get a brochure, but you'll only get a voucher for a, a Friday forum of your choice. So recruiters, there's actually a free lunch in this deal for you. Uh, and that's, uh, the, the mission of City Club has always been to uh, inform citizens about public issues and to arouse in citizens the uh, awareness of the obligations of citizenship. That's what Citizen City Club has always been about, and that's what we're still about. And uh, for us to achieve our mission, we need to have support from all of you to have programs like the very important one we're having today. So please consider what organizations like City Club means to you, and uh, recruit and be recruited today if at all possible. Now, although we will be taking a Friday Forum break next week in honor of the Memorial Day weekend, on May 29th, we will welcome a former governor of Oregon as our Friday Forum guest. On that day, Governor John Kitzhaber will talk about the making uh, of the transition to a post-baby boomer America. That's two weeks from today here at the Friday Forum. And now to today's program. Since the national economic crisis began last fall, and thanks to the good work of the club's Friday Forum committee, we have heard from this microphone a series of presentations about the most important public issue we all care about, 
And of course, that's the economy, the economic outlook, and the impact on our public services. And each time we have heard more, the news has not gotten any better, and in fact, it has just seemed to get worse. Well, today we will hear, we will hear the latest news, because today the latest economic and state budget projections have been released by Oregon's Office of Economic Analysis, meaning they've been released by state economist Tom Potowski, who was one of those speakers that we heard from at this microphone earlier this year. So how bad do things look as of this May 15th? What do we know now about the magnitude of the economic challenge facing our state and our state legislature as it now begins in earnest to craft a state budget for the next two years? How are, are our state's political leaders going to get Oregon through this difficult time of declining state revenues? And as our leaders deal with that fundamental question, what is going to happen to funding for those things that we all know are so important to Oregon's well-being and Oregon's future, like our schools, higher ed, health care, social services, investment in transportation and other infrastructure, and the challenges posed by the need to convert to a renewable energy society and to act on climate change? Well, who better to address all of this than our state's governor, who we are honored to have with us as our guest again at the Friday Forum. Our governor spent his childhood in rural Missouri and served a tour of duty as a Marine in Southeast Asia. After working as a truck driver and a bricklayer in a steel mill in Illinois, he put himself through the University of Missouri on the GI Bill, from which he also earned his law degree. After moving to Oregon and opening his law practice in Eugene, in 1975 he was elected to the Oregon House of Representatives, and then in 1978 to the state Senate. After serving as the state's insurance commissioner, in 1992 he ran for and was elected to be Oregon's attorney general, thereby uh, beginning a remarkable and unprecedented run of election to statewide office. In 1996, as a justice on the Oregon Supreme Court. In 2002, as governor of Oregon. And in 2006, he won re-election as governor. This all resulted in him being the only governor in Oregon history elected by voters to serve in all three branches of state government. Now, on a personal level, we all can probably imagine that in a lot of ways it must be a wonderful experience to be the governor of a great state like Oregon. But we might also ask ourselves, what must it be like to be governor when times are tough, like they are now? When, as governor, you know that the challenges facing so many Oregons are as severe as they are and yet state budgets for critical services need to be cut. What helps him keep perspective? What does he do uh, to remember what ultimately is important? And how does he stay grounded? Well, this governor, among other things, apparently loves the Rolling Stones and Waylon Jennings. He is known to be an avid fly fisherman and he's fond of Oregon microbrews. Uh, but probably more importantly, he and his wife, Mary Oberst, have three grown children, a dog named Hershey, and two grandchildren who his staff says he just adores. Now, his staff also tells me that he makes the most amazing animal sounds when young kids come to visit the state capitol. <laughs> and all of those things sound to me like very effective ways to stay grounded as a governor. So please welcome me, or please uh, help me in welcoming today's Friday Forum speaker, the 36th governor of the state of Oregon, the Honorable Ted Kulingoski. Thank you. Thank you, John, Jim, for your warm introduction. And thank you to the members of the City Club for giving me this opportunity to talk about Oregon's current employment and budget situation. This legislative session has been, and believe me, will continue to be, the most challenging Oregon has faced in many years. But I am determined to answer the question that I posed on the opening day of the 75th Legislative Assembly, what do we have to do to make things better? Third, first thing we have to do is to speak the truth, and the truth is we have a jobs emergency in Oregon. Over the last four months, this state has been shedding jobs at an alarming rate. New employment numbers will come out Monday, but our current rate is a very painful 2.1%. It will take a national recovery 
to bring Oregon's unemployment rate back to the level it was two years ago. To the people of Oregon, especially those who have lost their jobs, I can report that your state government, in partnership with the private sector, remains committed to creating jobs during this economic crisis. Whether in new green technology, renewable energy, or our traditional industries tied to natural resources, we are always trying to find new and better ways to market Oregon as a great place to do business. I am confident that our investments in renewable energy and green technology will grow our state's economy if we use this economic downturn as an opportunity to make the right policy choices. But there is no escaping the fact that we have lost thousands of manufacturing jobs, and some of these jobs are not coming back. I don't want to paint too rosy of a picture today. We may have reached the end of the beginning of these difficult times, but more pain lies ahead. We must also acknowledge that in some parts of our state, they are hurting more than in other parts. So as far as I'm concerned, this recession will not be over anywhere in Oregon until it is over everywhere in Oregon. That said, I want you to know we have not lost control of our destiny. We will not, as a people, surrender to fear. And we will get through this. Oregon has always been more than the sum of our economic statistics. We are a resilient people in a place of beauty at a time of trial and hope. And I have always put my money on hope and optimism. So I want every Oregonian to know optimism is not a word from a bygone era. It is still a guiding principle in my life. And when this recession ends, and it will end, we will emerge stronger and better prepared for the future than we have ever been. There truly is opportunity in these troubled times if we have the courage and self-confidence to seize it. The place to start is with jobs. President Roosevelt gave hope to millions of unemployed Americans when he created the Civilian Conservation Corps and other job programs. We need to take the same kind of immediate action in Oregon. When it comes to putting as many Oregonians back to work as quickly as possible, I say to every employer, public, private, and nonprofit, we are the first responders now. For the state's part, today, I am announcing a new program that will create 12,000 temporary jobs this summer. 12,000 jobs this summer. This is is about more than helping out-of-work Oregonians put bread on the table. This is also about restoring pride and dignity to the human spirit. A job can do that, especially when the job demands a skill that benefits the places we live and the places we live near. I want to bring hope and opportunity to Oregonians who want nothing more than to get back on their feet, put in a hard day's work, bring home a paycheck, and contribute to the state we love. George Will once wrote in a book about baseball called Men at Work. He called it, kept it very, very simple. I'm going to do the same thing. I'm calling our new jobs program the Emergency Jobs Program. There are a lot of details about the Emergency Jobs Program, but the one I want you to remember is this. The state will provide the funding, but the state will not get any bigger. The state government will not get any bigger. The emergency jobs program will be, the hiring will be done by the uh, local governments, the cities, the counties, the nonprofits, and companies who provide community services around Oregon. The emergency jobs program would be more than a lifeline for workers. These jobs will benefit the cities and towns where we live, the natural resources that define who we are as a people, and our most vulnerable citizens who we have a moral obligation to protect.
the Oregon Food Bank will sponsor up to 1,000 jobs throughout the state. Thousands of other Oregonians will be employed by community groups to clear trails, repair campsites, clean up watersheds, and thin underbrush from our forest. And still more will work for human service agencies and organizations. Do Oregonians want and need these jobs? The answer is yes. Today, 82,000 of our fellow citizens are looking for jobs that require the skills we need and pay the salary we are able to offer. But the emergency jobs program, which is designed to start in July because many of the new jobs can only be done in the summer, needs quick action by the legislature. I want the legislature to step up and be a partner with me on this program. Together, we can put thousands of Oregonians back to work. Delay is not an option. As I mentioned, we'll know more about the unemployment number Monday, but we have a revenue forecast today. We have about $4 billion less today to provide the same level of services we did in June 2007. That means state government cannot provide the same level of services in the new biennium that we are providing in the current biennium. That is going to be the starting point for much of the rest of my remarks. A budget of $13 billion down from over $17 billion isn't just about a new number. It is a new reality that will require changing a lot of what we want to do in order to protect what we absolutely must do. General Motors is going to have to live without Pontiac, even though there are probably millions of loyal Pontiac owners, some in this audience. Well, every state agency, board and commission, has its loyal supporters too. I get that. But the money simply isn't there anymore. Some government functions have to go, at least for the foreseeable future. Oregon State Government no longer can be all things to all people. That's why I'm asking the legislature to suspend a wide variety of agencies, boards, and commissions. These include the Board of Occupational Therapy, the Board of Massage Therapists, the Consumer Advisory Council, the Commission, for the Blind, the Board of Licensed Dietitians, and the Advocacy Commissions, among others. I'm also pre preparing for possible consolidation among other agencies, the Aviation Department, and all of the health-related agencies, boards, and commissions. Furthermore, I'm asking Eastern Oregon University, OSU's Cascade Campus in Bend, and the Chancellor's Office to work with our community colleges to better integrate our delivery systems for post-secondary education in Eastern Oregon. And I'm reviewing consolidating the Oregon Student Assistance Commission into the Oregon University system. The, this critical program has been a long-standing priority of mine. But I want you to know nothing state government does gets special treatment if there is a better, more strategic, and less expensive way to provide the same service. But I must be honest and tell you that suspending and consolidating agencies, boards, and commissions is a lot easier than cutting the budgets of departments, agencies, and programs that provide services to the people of Oregon, which they cannot do without. I'm in ongoing discussions with the legislative, le legislative leaders every day. We are working hard to find the right mix of budget cuts, governmental consolidations and suspensions that will produce a balanced budget for the 2009-11 biennium. My priorities are practical and immediate, and I know that the legislature shares them. At the top of my list is education. It has been since the first, my first day in office and remains so today. I believe that education is the pathway to success in our individual lives and in the life of our state of Oregon. I originally proposed a $6.3 billion budget for K through 12. That number was based on last November's revenue forecast. I want the 2009 and 11 budget to get as close to my original number as possible, 
and I will work with the legislature to achieve that objective. But I also know that my priorities are not absolute. When the state has the necessary revenue to fund the essential programs of education, human services, and public safety, and the debate is where to spend additional revenue once those core programs have been taken care of, I have always put the additional revenue where it belongs, in the education enterprise, which means from preschool to graduate school and the Opportunity Grants program. But in times like this, when we don't have the revenue state government needs to fully fund our core programs, then we have to make painful adjustments. And that, unfortunately, includes education. The reality is, education is not the only responsibility of state government. The state must also look out for our most vulnerable citizens, keep the public secure in their homes and on the streets of their community, and protect our pristine environment. And that is just a partial list. In a perfect world, it would be the first, I would be the first in line to give our schools every dollar they need. But as governor, I have to work on a much larger canvas. And as everyone in this room knows, the facts have changed, the state's general fund has changed, and our hope for an early economic recovery has certainly changed. My other three priorities are transportation, health care for all Oregon children, and progress toward a green energy future. The question is, how do we pay for all these priorities? Unlike many of others, the other states, we still have money in reserve. There is $900 million in federal stimulus funds and another $900 million in the Rainy Day Fund and the Education Stabilization Fund. We will build the federal stimulus dollars into the 09-011 budget. But I believe that it would be a mistake to do a smash and grab on our state's other reserve funds. I used to serve in the legislature, and I am sympathetic to the pressures legislators are under. Well, at least sometimes. The understandable impulse, always, is to take it all now. But immediate gratification is rarely a good thing. Let me illustrate my point with a simple comparison. Suppose a two-income family has $5,000 in their savings account. They know that one of them will lose their job in the next two to three months. Would you recommend they spend all of their family reserves now? The answer is obvious. Well, the state is in the same position. The end of the legislative session is a long, long way from the end of the biennium. The economy has not stopped its decline, and we do not know what a recovery will look like when the current economic decline does end. If we don't hold on to the reserves, we're setting, we're setting ourselves up for hundreds of millions of dollars, if not more, in additional cuts next year. And no money to put away to cover the losses. We've seen this movie before. It's called Five Special Sessions in 2002. And we do not want to do that again. With 90% of the budget, 90% uh, of the state budget allocated to education, human services, and public safety, and the state responsible for balancing all three of these core functions, it would be irresponsible to take the savings now when we still have more, when we need more accurate information next year about where best to allocate our reserves. And speaking of revenue, let me review what I said last December. I proposed four new sources of revenue in my December budget. I remain committed to all four of them. One, a provider tax to provide health care for all Oregon children up to age 19, and which will also allow us to access $1 million in federal health care funds for health care for other Oregonians.
Two, a gas tax to invest in a modern transportation system, which is the circulatory system of our economy. Three, an increase in the corporate minimum tax, which, hasn't, which has been $10 for more than seven decades. It was $25 in 1929. And four, a cigarette tax increase to provide more alcohol and drug treatment. And now here's one more thing to keep in mind about new revenue. The gas tax and increases in vehicle registration fees are dedicated to highways and other transportation needs. The provider tax is dedicated to health insurance for 80,000 children and over 50,000 or more adults in that Oregon health plan. So neither of these two new re sources of revenue provides any relief to the general fund, including education. That can only come from raising the corporate minimum and or an increase in the income tax rates for incomes above a quarter of a million dollars. I will work with the legislative leadership to develop an increase in the corporate income tax for, as I said, incomes higher than a quarter of a million dollars. Reasonable people can disagree, and I expect a lively debate on the income tax issue between now and June. Will any of the taxes targeted to help the general fund make it through the legislature? We'll know the answer in the next few weeks. But I can tell you with absolute certainty that any tax package that is both politically feasible and won't damage an already weak economy will not be enough to dig our way out of the current budget hole. We are probably facing a slow growth recovery. The time has come to ask ourselves, do we want to apply a tourniquet to temporarily stop the bleeding of jobs, incomes, and school days, or do we want to find a cure? We are a great state. We continue to draw people from around the world and who want to share in Oregon's beauty and unique quality of life. How did we get into the situation where at a time when we need flexibility and creativity and the ability to make difficult but wise choices, state government is handcuffed and unable to respond to this crisis? The answer is, we did it to ourselves. Today, the 90% of the budget I mentioned for education, human services, and public safety are caught in a budgetary vice. They're squeezed between unfunded mandates on one end, primarily measures five and 50 regarding local governments and the property tax, and measure 11 and measure 57 for prisons, and dedicated funding on the other end, including Measure 66 for parks, the gas tax for highways, and the corporate and individual kicker. The vice leaves government with a shrinking general fund and very little flexibility when economic conditions change as they did suddenly at the end of 2007. The time has come to have a discussion with the public about the reality of our budgetary vice. This will not be an easy conversation, but if there was ever an appropriate time, it is after we manage through this legislative session and chart our path forward. If we want to preserve quality education in Oregon, if we want to save family wage jobs, if we want to stop this wrenching between choices of protecting children and protecting seniors, and if we want to end the insanity of walking, waking up every few years trying to dig our way out of a deep budget hole, we must do something different. 
Our current situation is an opportunity for state government to look at new and different ways to provide services to the people of our state. For state government, economic recovery must not be an excuse to go back to business as usual in a way we raise, spend, and fail to save revenue, change must be our objective. That means putting our financial house on a sound footing going forward. To accomplish this change, I have in mind, after the legislative session is over, I will assemble a cabinet of experts from education, human services, and public safety. The cabinet, which will be under my direct supervision, will address issues that help us break the vice I mentioned and end this budgetary insanity. I'll have a bit more to say about this in July, but for now, I just want you to know that I will expect my cabinet to fully vet issues which are both critical and controversial. The bottom line is, I want the cabinet that I am appointing in July to take a comprehensive and strategic look at all of the mandates, state and federal, that control budget and revenue decisions. The cabinet will report back to me by December the 1st. I will then determine whether to recommend to the legislature constitutional changes in the critical ballot measures I mentioned, including the kicker. Because at the end of the day, it is the citizens of Oregon who will decide. They must be the masters of their own fate and the builders of their own future. If I could, I would lift the stark veil of this economic downturn immediately. I cannot do that. As I said, there are more difficult days ahead. But even during these very tough economic times, Oregon, beautiful Oregon, is still a place that attracts newcomers, new businesses, new thinking, and yes, new jobs. Today, our minds are focused on putting our citizens back to work and protecting the core services state government must provide. But around the corner is a different future, with Oregon creating thousands of energy jobs, investing millions in green technology, and leading America's green energy revolution. I promise you this, there is a better day coming for Oregon, because this is still the place where hope begins and the trail to America's promised land ends. Thank you all very, very much. Thank you, Governor. The first uh, question for our speaker, as always, will be from our Board of Governors host. Our Board host today is City Club's President-elect Sue Thomas. Sue Thomas is co-founder of Avatar, an organizational development consulting firm uh, that specializes in strategic planning, organizational change, and partnership building. Uh, before becoming President-elect, uh, Sue shared the research board. Sue? Thank you, Jim. You mentioned that uh, in December you released your budget, and since then obviously a lot of things have happened. Uh, in the intervening six months, which probably feels like significantly more than that, um, you've been criticized fairly significantly for uh, the leadership that you have shown during the budgeting cycle. How would you respond to that criticism, and how do you see your role in this? Actually, uh, I recognize that every governor that I know of has been accused of this. And this isn't anything that it's uh, unique to me. I think it was every governor that's been in a tough economic time, the people have an expectation that they're going to be able to do something immediately. I think everyone in this room knows how difficult this economic situation is. I don't think in traveling a state like I do, and I do it all the time, that I have to tell the public anything about how difficult it is. If you're in my position and you're out in a crowd and you're talking to people, you know what they're talking about? They're not talking about the budget, interestingly enough. What they're talking about to me is they say, Governor, I need a job. Governor, I'm worried about my health care. Governor, I'm worried about my house being foreclosed on. Governor, I don't have any health care for my children. 
What are you doing to get us back to work? The problem, I think, that in this whole debate about whether you're doing this or that is that you're missing the target. What the citizens want is they want a job. And let's focus on getting them back to work. And I gave you a jobs program that will put 12,000 people back to work. That's the best thing we can do. The legislature, at my request, will put out a $2 billion capital improvement program that will create thousands of jobs in this state. We are the most aggressive state with the stimulus, federal stimulus program trying to get our people back to work. Our Department of Transportation was the first state in the country that put every federal dollar in the stimulus that they got through the trans transportation program out to bid. All of those programs will be providing jobs this summer. If you want to criticize me, criticize me for not creating enough jobs. I'm doing everything I can. I need your help. We will now take questions from the floor, asking questions at City Club Friday Forums is a privilege of City Club membership. We actually have two microphones today. Uh, try to keep your question to 30 seconds or less, identify yourself, and remember to ask a question. <laughs> Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Governor, for being here. Governor, even as the general fund shrinks, the state's all-fund budget is increasing by 8%. As of yesterday, the House had passed 20 bills that in aggregate increase state spending by $275 million over the prior budget, a 7.5% increase. The House Republicans have, produ have produced a budget that fully funds education and public safety without raising taxes during a recession. What elements of the Republican Back to Basics budget will you adopt, and how will you justify to voters a job-killing tax increase when such an increase is unnecessary? Well, let me tell you first is I think if you want me to give you one word about the Republican budget proposal, it is baloney. Baloney. And recognize it for that. It is just playing with numbers. The fact is that this is the group that always talks about no taxes, but then they talk about funding schools. They talk about health care for all their children in the state. They talk about creating more jobs for the people of this state. The reality is, it's all smoke and mirrors to them. And the reality is, is when I read something, and something that's very dear to me after I've worked for the last five years to get 24-7 coverage with the state police, and the thing that galls me is that they propose to cut the state police and eliminate the 24-7 coverage for around the state. The truth of it is, you have to invest in the people of this state you have to invest in our children. It does take more revenue. It is not an easy thing to always tell people in the most difficult economic time that in fact, we do need more revenue to provide a quality education program. This isn't just about K through 12. It's about our community colleges. It's about our higher education system. It's about preschool. It's about giving people opportunity. And for those who have, they should contribute more. And that's what I've asked them to do. Wade Fickler, City Club member. Governor Kulingoski, on a number of occasions, you have said that in lean times, children's programs must go to the front of the budget line. What is your bottom line on funding for Head Start, Early Head Start, and child care subsidies? Well, as I said, that my budget is originally on, uh, um, in February in, in uh, December was uh, 6.3, and as I told you, that I will work with the legislature to get as close to that number as, as possible. Um, obviously, that um, if you force me to a number, um, I think somewhere that we're going to be around um, six billion dollars before this thing's all over, total. Governor, my name is Angela Wyckoff, and I'm a City Club member. Um, today, there are many representatives from higher education sitting in this room, and I know they're all very interested in seeing what's going to happen in the future. And you've always been such a strong supporter of higher education. But as you know, um, the system has been asked to do more and more with less and less, and is asked to look at percentage cuts at each biennium. 
and you have also mentioned some revenue enhancement measures. I wonder if you could expand a little bit more on higher education because it is the future of this state. You know, one of the first things I did as governor is, is try to get the state legislature to stop looking at education in this bifurcated fashion of that there's K through 12, and then there's community colleges, and then there's higher ed, because in this debate, the reality is in the political process in Salem, K through 12 wins, and the community colleges and higher education lose. And what I wanted them to do is to see a continuum of education from preschool, K through 12, community colleges, higher ed. And I think we are moving in that direction. The question you asked, though, is, about higher ed is, is probably the most challenging one for us, and I will tell you why. I believe, as I told you in my remarks, that this is going to be a slow economic recovery. And though I spoke to you today about the 0911 budget, as citizens of this state, I think all of us should look a little bit further down the road and ask ourselves, what will we do if it is a slow recovery, and in fact that we do not have the economic growth in the state for five or six years that is going to give us the revenue to fund these core programs around education, around social services, and around public safety. And one of the things I think we're going to be challenged in what I'm after between, February, uh, between July 1 and the first of the year is to look at our system of higher education as far as its relationship to the legislature. Now, I know he's in the audience today, and, and President Frommeyer has been a champion of trying to get the state to look a little bit different. He hasn't always come and just says, give us more money. He has said, look, we need more flexibility. We need to be a little bit more competitive, and I have, to be very blunt, have been somewhat reluctant to move what, the way he wanted because I always believed that the primary purpose of our university system was to provide access for our children here in this state to enter the at university and that university to provide a quality educational program for them. But for that to happen, I do think that the universities need more flexibility whether it includes putting them in a public corporation model like OXSU is a discussion we're going to have, but I ultimately think we are going to have to do business around higher education and how it's structured than the current system we have. So my answer to you is we will get through this biennium, but I think long term we are going to have to restructure the relationship between higher education in this state and the uh, university system. I think that they do need the flexibility that they're talking about. Ted Kay, City Club member. Governor, we Oregonians appear to believe that we can successfully finance state government differently from most states. With no sales tax and a constrained property tax, we rely primarily on a personal income tax, which has given us the most volatile tax revenues in the nation. I believe we've been proven wrong in that belief. Last time you spoke here, I asked you about reforming our tax system. As I recall, your answer was that the public would not accept changes until state government earned more of the public's confidence. But given the current economic climate, isn't this the time to present the hard choices to the public and finally address tax reform in our state? Well, you know, every time that anyone talks about reform, they always talk about tax reform. And as I spoke to you in my remarks, there are some structural problems of the way we have managed to handcuff our state government into making these smart, wise decisions. I do not deny to you that tax reform is part of a larger discussion. But you have to look at the system we have currently, and what I tried to tell you in my remarks, we have basically between mandated, dedicated funding initiatives and unfunded mandated initiatives, we have created a situation where the state doesn't have the ability to have that flexibility. That's the issue that I'm talking to you about. 
That's the issue I think we have to resolve with the public. That's the discussion we need to have with them, is what do they expect from their government? We can't do it in these economic hard times with the current structure we have. The revenue issue you ask me is a very interesting one, and I had my Council of Economic Advisors come down about a month ago, and we were talking, and I asked them the question you did about the sales tax. And they said, first of all, Governor, if you look all around, the states that have a sales tax are doing a little worse than we are right now. So I'm not telling you that that's the direction we should go. But what they did say, and which I have tried to do since I've been the governor, they says the way you bring stability into this protect, progressive tax system, which we have, and I do believe it is, on the income tax, is to actually build in a mandated rainy day fund. They said you need to put more money in the ring. And that's the issue around the kicker, which the legislature has before it, which I think they will either send out now or in January, which will actually put that kicker money into a rainy day fund. And I think that's the direction we should go. Uh, Paul Milius, City Club member. <clears throat> uh, in 1971, this club published a study that recommended legalizing personal use of cannabis. Uh, since then, we've fought the war on drugs, which by my thinking, any objective standard, has been a public policy failure of the first order. Governor Schwarzenegger recently said, uh, was recently quoted saying, it was time to do a serious study of the revenue potential for regulating and taxing uh, cannabis. Revenue estimates for Oregon vary widely, but all are in the hundreds of millions of dollars, and multiply that if we include industrial uses of hemp and industrial agriculture. As part of your strategic review of states' financing, would you support an organization like City Club, and I'm not speaking for the club here, like City Club, Cascade Policy Institute, or some other wonky outfit, you know, doing such a study and making recommendations about how we might uh, take advantage of this huge untapped revenue source? Paul, the other part of Governor Schwarzenegger's statement at the end was that they said, well, Governor, do you support the legalization or the deregulation or the decriminalization of all marijuana? And he says, no, I'm not saying that. Let me, if you're asking me that whether the state should look at, at the issue of, of the, and I, you use marijuana, I, I'm going to tell you, the state and it's part of the discussion I talked about earlier about what we're going to do in the, in the um, July to January period is to look at the criminal justice system and the role of drugs and how we handle that system. Let me, let me just tell you something, is that because this is a little strange. Look, I'm the governor of the greatest state in the country as far as I'm concerned. I tell all the other governors, you know, I was so blessed Fifty of us could be governors, and I got the best. And I always take great pride in it, but I'm always surprised at some of the things we do. And the problem right now <laughs> is I don't understand this penchant to spend more money on building prisons when we should be investing in children in schools. It makes no sense. Now let me tell you when I said to you, you know we did it to ourselves? Do you know right now people come up to me and they say, Governor, you have to develop a policy to reduce prison population. Now we know you can't do it with Measure 11, but all the other people, you can take them out. Do you know what I have to do now because of Section 44 in the Oregon Constitution that was in the Crime Victims Bill of Rights? Any time I reduce the sentence of an inmate, I have to send them back to, jail, to the court, and the judge has to have a hearing and determine whether, in fact, my release protects the public. You know what else I have to do? I have to give a notice to the victims. I have an elaborate process set up. I, I'm struggling about how to handle this issue of building more prisons in this state. 
I have to meet a prison forecast, a, 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 a forecast, a prison forecast. It's the law. I have to build toward that prison forecast. But let me suggest to you where we're at right now, and the people here in front of me are the ones who, Max Williams, who is my director of the Department of Corrections, lives with this every day. I actually look at it the way I do. You can actually try to find out how can you get people who are already in out? Or is it smarter to go to the front end and say, how can I reduce the number of people coming in? That's what I'm trying to do. If you want to help me, do you know right now, with Measure 57, I can give you two options with it. I can just delay it. The public have spoken. I know that. But what if we just said that because of these economic hard times, let's not spend more money on building another prison, but let's invest in our schools. Why don't we just delay it for two years? Get us past this. Let their economy start coming back and then do something. You know what my problem is? It takes a two-thirds vote of the legislature. It takes a two-thirds vote. I need 20 votes in the Senate and 40 in the House. I want, I have another idea for 57. Do you know before 57 was passed, there were a group of people who now get mandatory sentences that under the old sentencing structure had a presumptive sentence of probation. Why don't we just pass an amendment that allows the presumption for probation for these first, these offenders to occur? You know why? I need two-thirds vote to do it. 40 in the Senate, 40 in the House, and 20 in the Senate. It is very difficult to make smart policy choices because of the handcuffs we put on ourselves through the initiative process, through 11, 57, and all these other things we've done. We have to get smart sometime. There is nothing wrong, and there are people in this room who probably voted for these, and this is not a criticism of the citizens that did, because at the time it may have been the right thing, but it is not the right thing today, and we have to look at it differently. Greg McPherson, City Club member. Governor, the legislature has proposed scaling down the Jobs and Transportation Act from the $500 million that you proposed. Uh, a key uh, a goal of your proposal was to reduce the uh, greenhouse gases that come from our transportation sector. Do you believe that Oregon risks doing too little on transportation and global warming this year? Yes and yes. But again, uh, we have been through this. Look. I don't want everybody to walk out of here and have anything, just a negative view maybe of what is happening in Salem, because I'm going to tell you, they have done remarkable work. And I, and I want to congratulate the President of the Senate because he put out a bill uh, uh, within the first month that actually was $175 million, over 500 uh, deferred maintenance projects th throughout the state, and they will all be out to bid by the end of this month, and I think he's to be commended for it because he put people to work. Those are the things that I think people are trying to do. The issues around health care, there is going to be a provider tax and we are going to cover 80,000 children plus 50,000 or more adults. The legislature is going to do it. And the transportation package, yes, I did want a five, roughly $500 million a year program. This because the way we do things, the, it has been uh, uh, put down to uh, 300 million. It is still the, and this is 300 million annual. It's 600 million in the biennium, and it will bond over a billion dollars worth of road projects throughout this state. This is the first ongoing increase in our highway transportation system in over 50 years. This is very, very significant, and though I wish it were more, I am willing to take what we are going to get out of this because they are going to pass the transportation program. Ray Polani, a city club member. Uh, Governor, uh, we need change. There's no question we need change. We need appropriate change. America needs jobs, you're right. 
America needs extra trains, not extra lanes. My question is, why did the Oregon Department of Transportation refuse to consider commuter rail between Portland and Vancouver and local road access to Hayden Island in their multi-million dollar Columbia River crossing study? I have no idea. Well, I, I, I'm sorry, I, I, I don't know. I don't know the answer. Because I know rail and, and, and light rail are critical pieces of the transportation program, uh, of the Columbia River Crossing Bridge. We are very committed to it. The, why on Hayden? I don't know. I don't know the answer. Uh, <laughs> just goes to show you we're all human. I don't know everything. Go ahead. Chris Allman, City Club member. Having been a member of the Early Care and Education Research Committee here for Portland City Club and running for school board in Beaverton, I'm very glad that you are prioritizing education. And I'm glad that you are asking for corporate taxations, more corporate taxes. However, as I understand it, your, um, your suggestion would bring in about 37 million. I'm wondering what you believe, what you think about the coalition, which includes Stand for Children's um, proposal, to change the income tax structure from the current 6.6% to what we have for personal income taxes, which is projected to bring in over $230 million. Thank you. Well, I, I take it that you're referring to uh, um, I think it's the, the corporate minimum tax that I put in my budget. It wasn't 36, it was 85 million. And we're working on that now. Uh, on the broader issue of, of uh, what I told you, let me suggest this to you. What I think we're working on is that trying to provide the level of services to the people of the state that I think are demanded, the, the human services. You know, I, I know education is, is an issue. Uh, but I want you to know something. You sit in my position, and when I sit with my directors of the Department of Human Services and you come in, Dr. Goldberg, who is sitting down here in front, has a very unique way. He runs the program of dealing with me. These aren't numbers to him. You know how he talks to me? They're people. They're faces. He brings case studies in of what this program does for this person how it gives them a chance to have a life. And I'm going to tell you, it's very, very difficult because I'm trying to balance the investment in education, the investment in human services. Do you know, it shouldn't be a surprise to anybody, the largest growth in the state budget right now is human services. People are lining up. It's food. It's shelter. It's the basic necessities of life. And so I'm trying to balance that with all the other things we do, and there's not enough money. So I told you that on the tax side, the legislature and I, the revenue side, I've given you the four. We are working with the legislature on a revenue number that will raise between corporate and individuals above a quarter of a million dollars, I believe it will be somewhere around a billion dollars. The side on the carpet, on the carpet side of this, there's a balance. And the components of it will be the carpet minimum tax, a change in the carpet rate structure, and a filing fee issue. The remainder will come off of the income tax side of this. So we're not going to do it exactly the way that you presented the question to me, but we're moving in your direction to actually do it on the corporate side. We've run out of time, so we need to stop there. Uh, please uh, consider joining us in two weeks when we'll hear from former Governor Kitzhaber. Uh, please remember that all of you that are City Club members, you can't leave until you bring a non-City Club member to the membership table. And as we close, I want to uh, ask you to join me 
In thanking our governor, it's an unusual circumstance to have somebody answer questions like this. Thank you, Governor. We're adjourned.